I'm Trevor Cummings, and these are my thoughts on money. Hello, and welcome to the Thoughts on Money podcast, what we like to call Tom. I'm Trevor Cummings, your host of the podcast and your author of the Thoughts on Money blog. I am here with my good friend and colleague, Mr. Sean Latimer. Hello. How are you doing today? Doing great. Good. Um, I wrote an article called Respecting Time Horizons. Uh, I actually had a different article I wanted to write this week, but I was mentioning to Sean before the podcast, I literally had four different friends call me in the last two weeks, might be the last 10 days, kind of with the same question. It's a sign. You had to do it. I had to do it. Um, so the question was, and again, I'm actually curious, we can talk about on the podcast, uh, if there's a theme there, what it means about like what's going on in the economy and all that. So we can kind of go there. But all four of them uh, had a little bit of extra money. Um, and they're kind of earmarking that money to be spent. I'm going to say all of them was less than five years. So one of them was going to spend it next year. One was like two or three years down the line. But the money kind of had a purpose it was already earmarked for. And they were like, hey, this money sitting in my checking account doing nothing. What in the world should I do? It's like the hardest question to answer, especially when you know that they're going to spend it. And especially because, when you're not getting paid to give the advice to. Well, yeah, <laughs> especially when yeah you have no skin in the game and they're just friends. So you're well, I guess you have skin in the game because if they don't like your advice, then it fires back on you. So it's a lose lose. It is a lose lose because like let, let's play uh, let's play out the scenario: the friend that is going to use the money in a year, you told him he should do. Yeah. So I'm boring. So I, I and I we'll talk about this in the article, but. When somebody starts asking those questions, I think as a new advisor, right, I always went into questions as like risk tolerance. And we'll talk about that. Yeah. But like my questions now are really simple. When are you going to spend the money? If you're going to tell me a time period less than five years, I'm going to say perfect. Either put the money in a money market fund or buy a treasury because then your rate of return is defined and you get your money back, you know, the day you're ready to spend it. Yeah. So, so the person with one year, you say buy a treasury. And what was his response? Wasn't it something funny? Yeah, I mean, so the treasuries is really simple. It's four and a half percent in that range, right? Yeah. So it's changing daily, but you know, it's somewhere in the range of four and a half percent. So for me, I'm like, hey, you know, let's say somebody had a million dollars, forty five thousand dollars, cool. You don't have to worry about anything. It's just defined. But it's not exciting. It's yeah. not sexy. It, everybody, like we joke around a lot, everybody wants the mystery box. So they're like, hey, like what if I buy some stocks? And they started naming off some specific so stocks that got just crazy beat up last year and mentioning things like, hey, that was a $500 stock and now it's a $200 stock. So I know where it's going back to 500. Of course. I'm just unsure about when the bottom is. And I'm like, ha, huh, it's not totally how things work. Yeah, I just laugh at, at that response like, oh, that's boring. I want something more exciting. Or, uh, you know, because if, and the reason why it's a lose lose, because what could happen in 2023, markets could be up 20%, right? And then that same friend goes, oh, you're I bad lost, at your, you're bad at your I lost job. two hundred thousand dollars because of your bad advice, Trevor. Mm -hmm. I sh I knew I should have put it in what a ABC company or a index fund, right? Instead, I put it in a treasury, and it was boring. Shame on me. Yeah, and it's kind of there's two things happening. I titled the article "Respecting Time Horizons" because I think you got to respect time horizons. Like you have to put the probabilities in your favor. But then there's another conversation about valuations. And that's a really hard discussion to have with people where I'm telling them like, hey, it's not as simple as looking at where a stock price used to be and then anchoring towards like that's where it's headed next. And I remember talking to somebody uh, like six months ago um, and I was asking her, I was like, hey, what's your, your favorite food? And she's like, licorice. I'm like, okay, perfect. Licorice it is. I'm like, you go into the grocery store tomorrow, you see a tub of red vines uh, and it's $1,000. Do you buy it? And she's like, no way. I'm like, but wait, it's your favorite food. Like, why wouldn't you buy it? She's like, it, it, who would pay $1,000 for licorice? I'm like, exactly. So you've already defined what the value of licorice is. Now, if you came in the next day and it was $500, would you buy it? No, I'm not paying $500. But it's half off. <laughs> it's half off, exactly. So um, the right work that she was able to do, because she's so familiar, she knows what red vines are worth. Um, it's different when you're dealing with the stock market. There's a lot of valuation work to do to figure out all the idiosyncrasies of that company, right? Their tax situation, uh, their liabilities, like all the things that could be headwinds or tailwinds for that company. It's not as simple as looking at what the stock price used to be. Yeah, and I think we're all guilty of that too because I, I remember during you know the COVID moment, we'd look at certain companies or things that are down 80 90%. 
And uh, I remember uh, we were at lunch once and you're like, well, how many times can something get cut in half? And I was like, ah, oh, is this a trick question? Hold on. Uh, always? And you're like, yeah, it could, it could keep happening. And, and it was kind of an aha moment that you're right. If you're not familiar with the company or the fundamentals, just because it's uh, off its high, even by a lot, does not mean it's a good investment. Yeah, I love that point. Could a $100 stock become a $50 stock? Yes. Could a $50 stock then become a $25 stock? Yes. Could it then become a twelve fifty stock, right? So this idea of getting cut in half over and over and over again. And a lot of times I'll mention companies that I know that they know. I'm like, hey, you're familiar with this company. And they're like, of course, Trevor. I know that household name, right? I'm like, do you know that the stock price is less today than it was 20 years ago? Right. And they're like, no. And it's like, okay, it's okay. I'm not expecting you to go out and do this valuation work. I just want you to respect the difficulty of it and understand it's a lot more than just looking at yesterday's paper of where a price used to be and saying, hey, it's going to head there again. Yeah. I had a thought too. Um, it's a little bit off topic, but you mentioned earlier, you know, you got all these texts kind of the same time in the same vein, right? So it reminds me that when markets are really hot, uh, you get that feeling of euphoria. And that's when you get these types of questions like, oh, I should put it in this stock or this stock or stocks have been great, right? But you, it almost has the same effect on the opposite side when markets have been beat up. Because mm -hmm. then they think like, oh my gosh, it's bargain time, right? Like you, the best time to buy is when there's blood in the streets, right? Mm -hmm. Shouldn't I be putting all my money in stocks all the time? But it, it, I think both are bad sentiments. So it just shows how hard it is to be an investor. Yeah, that's a really good point because all of these people I'm speaking of, I would um, say they're very intelligent um, in the business world and they understand how this works. So I, I think that there is probably like a buy the dip mentality mm -hmm. um, there. The hard part is like if you go study market history and you look at post uh, tech bubble, um, it was not painful for 12 months. It was painful for 36 months. Yeah. And, you know, we could be in early innings of, of that sort of pain for those particular type of securities or investments. So I was just surprised, like maybe coincidence, but man, I'm getting the same question over and over again. There's something there. Like that's enough of a sample size for me where I'm like, okay, people have a little bit of an extra discretionary money. They're seeing like a new year, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's what January marks. Yeah. They're looking at last year in that 12 calendar months, which the market doesn't work that way. It doesn't work off no. 12, it, you know? <laughs> um, and they're just like, hey, this could be opportunistic which I like that mindset. I like savers who want to be long-term investors. But what this article is about is you have to respect time horizons. Um, and one of the things I mentioned in the article, and this is what I try to explain, and I do a really bad job at it, because even when I'm text messaging or having a, a phone call with a friend to kind of explain this, I don't think it like sinks in. But I, I tell them, hey, go look at the stock market over the last 50-some years, right? 70 years, whatever, whatever period. And look at rolling five-year periods, right? Because I'm, I'm, I'm saying rolling five-year periods because it's looking at all five-year calendar periods, and that's a longer time horizon than any of these people had. Right. And then I say, how often were the returns negative? And I can just define it for you. I put in the article, 13% of the time, the returns were negative for those rolling five-year periods. 25% of the time, or something close there, I'm, I'm pretty close, the returns were less than what I'm telling you the fixed rate is on a five-year treasury. Yeah. So I'm trying to encourage people, you want to put probabilities in your favor. So if you tell me I have a 75% chance, you are absolutely right. But if you've earmarked this for something particular, like you're building a home or you're buying a new home or it's your son's college tuition, whatever it is, you don't want a 25% chance of it not working out in your favor. Yeah, sometimes you have to put it into more reality because uh, when people hear dollars and percentages and returns, you kind of get sucked into the jargon. But when you say things like, uh, hey, let me put in two scenarios, um, what's going to make you happier or more unhappy? If you um, you were right and I was wrong, and instead of doing the treasury, you ended up getting a 10% return and you made an additional $60,000 on your million dollars. Congratulations. Or you lost $200,000 and now you can't pay for the new house and your wife's upset. Which one's worse? Anything or which one's that, better? Any equation where the wife is upset, yeah, I, would, I, know, right? I would avoid yeah. that completely. Right. And I've, I've, I've probably said this on the podcast because I've had that exact conversation and fill in the blank. You can't pay for your daughter's wedding. You can't buy that vacation home. You can't help your son in his freshman year tuition. And whatever the scenario is, they, they hear that and I hope it kind of brings them back down to earth. Like, 
oh yeah, what's really most important? It, it's to make your financial plan work. Yeah, and uh, as two guys talking about a podcast, we know how much hubris uh, men have. Uh, and I can't tell you how many conversations I've had where um, a husband's like, hey, I'm coming to you because my wife says, I can't do this anymore. <laughs> yeah. Like, she's yeah. not going to deal with it uh, because she really has, like, super simple, like, I want to retire in X. I have, you know, defined this, that, and the other. Um, I don't want you doing Vegas odds with uh, with our retirement money anymore. Oh, that's a, it's such a, like, a sensitive situation when someone comes to the Bonds Group inquiring about possibly becoming a client. And you try to ask basic questions, and you're looking at their balance sheet and their investment accounts and the statements. And you kind of ask like, oh, yeah, so how did you pick these investments now? And I, and I can almost feel the tension sometimes between the husband and wife when I see a lot of red on the statement. And, and they go, oh, I've been kind of doing it myself. I dabble. You know, I do this. And I'm sitting there thinking, dabbling with millions of dollars of life savings. All right. Well. Yeah, I wanted to nail home the point, which I, I know this is probably too, uh, too exaggerated. But I was like, hey, if I told you there's a 13% chance that your next flight was going to crash, you're not going to board that plane. I, when I read that, I was like, well, it's a little extreme, but yeah, I get your uh, point. The next one, I was like, hey, there's a 25% chance that the next meal you have, you know, gives you food poisoning. Yeah, that one was a little bit better. You're going to skip the meal. <laughs> but the point is, is that um, we we trust in probabilities in so much of our life. Like, that's kind of how we have heuristics on, on what we do and kind of how we operate. Uh, for some reason, we just throw everything out the window when it comes to investing because, I, I don't know, our emotions go wild on both sides. Like, right, like fear and like, could you imagine if, you know, what if I just, the FOMO kind of attitude, yeah. I guess. You said it right too, that it, it is like an overconfidence. And it's not that uh, we think we know better. The reason why we would pick the treasury or the more conservative option is that we realize we do not know. No one knows. And so if you think you know something that the market doesn't, you're just setting yourself up for a surprise. I love that you said that because... I'm trying to get better at answering this question, but I get the question a fair amount of time where somebody's like, hey, what do you think 2023 is going to look like? The, oh, so you think it's going to be bad? And you're like, I don't, I don't I know. I have no idea. And I, I think people are disappointed in that answer where they're like, hey, what's 2023? I have no idea. I know. But like, what's your gut telling you? I, I, I don't, I really don't know. I, I wouldn't have been able to answer that at the start of 2022. Um, and I wouldn't have been able to answer that at the start of 2021. Like, I absolutely don't know. But as a professional... I'm opting out of trying to predict or forecast that short-term um, stuff. I'm studying history, looking at probabilities, looking at what your needs and expectations are, and building a financial plan that fulfills that. That's just not exciting. Yeah. All right, I got a new one for you. What about when they establish the time frame? So they go, you know, five, ten years. I may need a portion at that five-year mark, but it's going to be a while. And you're like, great. So you get fully invested, or let's say you build the allocation. It's invested, taxable account. And then six months later, hey, I'm going to need X amount of dollars from this account. And you're like, what? Wait a minute. I thought this was longer term. Has that happened to you? Yeah, it's happened a lot. And uh, I think you have to go back to the dialogue of saying, hey, let's – and this is what I'm trying to do. Again, every day I'm trying to become a better advisor. But I, part of becoming a better advisor is how well can you create clarity? And one of the things I'm trying to do lately is say, hey, let's just imagine we have two buckets of money. Like one bucket, good chance you might need to draw on it in the next couple years, three years, four years, five years. And then I might tell you, Sean, hey, where were you five years ago? Just to make sure that you understand how long five years is, right? Yeah. Um, and then the other bucket of money, and, and I want to use language and words that, that really align with what your aspirations are. Hey, this other bucket is long-term accumulation of wealth, right? Once we place it in there, think of a piggy bank, Sean, like we put it in there. You love that piggy bank, like the color, the the size, the everything. Like you, you somebody bought that for you. If you want to get that money out, you got to grab a hammer and break that <laughs> piggy bank. So if you're not ready to put money in that piggy bank, let's shift over here and let's look at those, you know, defined returns with treasuries and something like that. It's okay. It's okay to be unknown, but let's not put money in the piggy bank until it's like a known known. Yeah, I I, I find myself. Um when building allocations with clients, we, we do talk about expected rate of return and total return. And uh, and I think that's hard for people sometimes because if you say, okay, let's agree that we think stocks may have a total return of 7%. Let's be conservative. It's averaged higher in the past, but let's just say 7%. And if we think the average rate of return of fixed income or treasuries is going to be 3%, they it's kind of human nature to be like, well, I want, the, I want that one. I want the seven. I don't want the three. But then 
they have to be disciplined as far as they're making sure they stick to the plan, you know? Yeah, and but and again, that goes back to this idea of respecting time horizons. But it, even that same idea of like just clarity, it's really hard to explain that. The trouble I've had, it's not so much in people coming surprised, like you said, and be like, hey, I need to spend this money. It's tax payments. Uh, that's I have a lot of clients that have really strong incomes and you know really healthy balance sheets, but their tax bills are significant. So they'll come and they'll be like, hey, uh, you know, the tax bill is X. And I'm like, ew, it's like 20% of your portfolio. Where were we planning to get this from? And that's, it's more on me. I want to do a better job at getting engaged with their CPA and understanding, hey, Ahead of time. show me what these next five yeah. or six payments look like and kind of the cadence. And then I'm trying to get better at setting aside that kitty fund and whatnot so that when they come, like, yes, I set this money aside. We're ready to do that. Um, but that's the one that becomes difficult every time one of those quarterly tax payments come up because there have been times where I'm surprised. I'm like, wait, you didn't tell me about this. Like, this is not insignificant. Yeah, and that kind of goes into... Um this is maybe a, a, another topic for a, a different podcast, or, but that conversation of having one advisor manage a majority of the assets, a lot of times it has kind of a negative stigma of like, oh, it's a money grab. But uh, I have noticed multiple times, especially when tax loss harvesting or looking at estimated taxes, where if accounts are at different places and we don't, we, we just don't know. And I, I've seen that happen where uh, clients say, hey, I got this huge tax bill. What'd you guys do? And I pull up their 1099 and I'm reviewing it with them. And I go, no, it was kind of net neutral for the year. We didn't realize the gains. And then they realized it was their other account. And they realized $100,000 in capital gains or something like that. And they didn't know. And it, I'm not saying that, uh, you know, they're bad, we're good. I'm just saying that if it is consolidated, at least there's clarity and you can put together a plan and uh, there's less surprises. Yeah, you can't give advice or guidance or feedback on something you don't see. I had the exact same thing you're talking about happen. And weird word to use but it broke my heart like the tax bill was significant and it was the same thing was like whoa 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 trevor like why is my tax bill so big and i'm like wait a tick like i can even just think of 2022 like portfolio did well right yeah um it was it was it was up slightly but we realized significant losses we did tax loss harvesting and then i'm like oh this other custodian and the work wasn't done because when it's self-directed, it's not an obvious thing if you're self-directing your account that at the end of the year, you should look at all the positions, maybe, you know, toss some of the big winners into a donor advised fund and, mm -hmm. you know, harvest some of the losses. But uh, yeah, those surprise tax bills are the worst. And that's why I think, again, maybe I'm making an assumption here, but I think a lot of CPAs have you kind of overpay because they never want to be the deliverer of bad news. Yeah. So I you know, I often see that you're just rolling those extra payments over because it's such an uncomfortable conversation when there's a much bigger tax bill than one expected. Yeah. I will, you know, we've kind of covered this topic pretty good, but I want to circle back to even the beginning of the article. Um, I made a joke like, how in the world was somebody when I started in this industry okay with putting me in front of clients after yeah. just passing two license exams? Oh boy! Uh, but one of the things I mentioned in there is that when you're new and you know you can't you can't self create experience, right? The only way to get experience is time and chair. Yeah. So if you're new, what you're going to do? You're going to run the playbook, mm -hmm. right? So I remember when I was new, it was really simple. New client, great to meet you. Here's a risk survey. One through five. Yeah, fill out the risk survey. That tells me what model portfolio to take that off the shelf, put on. I remember even being in a cubicle and somebody more senior hearing me on the phone giggling because they're like, oh, you're going to put them in the model three or the model five. Yeah, and I'm like, yeah. gosh, I just don't even know what I'm doing. I'm trying my hardest. Yeah. Um, but the one thing I would say is as I matured as an advisor, risk tolerance matters. But I put a much larger weighting to time horizon now because you can't, you can't change time horizon. It is what it is. And I'm a firm believer, and I'm sure some people will disagree with me, but I'm a firm believer that you can expand your tolerance if you have the right advice giver, the right advisor that's kind of mapped out, hey, here's a need for it. And I mentioned that in the article, if I can show you that your financial plan really needs these types of rate of return that will equal this time of short-term volatility, and that I'm fully comfortable with how you're invested and I'll walk shoulder to shoulder with you, I think I can expand your tolerance. Uh, but I can't have an impact on your time horizon. It is what it is. Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah, it completely does. And we've talked about this on the podcast, and I had a call yesterday where um, just for fun, I was asking, you know, I was giving them an example that we run into clients that have robust balance sheets, and sometimes the allocation doesn't match their financial goals. And he was like, well, what do you mean? 
And I'm like, well, let's just play through a scenario. If someone's 70 years old and they have a robust balance sheet and they even say, I'm probably not gonna spend any of this money or this money in my lifetime. It's for my kids or my grandkids. I'm like, what would you think their allocation would be? And he's like, I don't know, like 70% bonds, 3% stocks. I'm like, good guess. Because if you fill out a survey online, it's gonna be much more conservative, right? Well, who's that money for? And they, you know, fill in the blank, kids. What's their time horizon? I don't know, 30, 40 years? That's right. So do you think you should have that much allocated bond? And you could almost see the light bulb go off where he's like, oh, I, no, I guess not. You would invest it differently. Time horizons really matter. Yeah, and what you did a really good job there, it's about earmarking too, right? Like, hey, you're going to need X for your lifetime, but you're not going to spend Y, right? There's this idea that there's a significant surplus that's legacy money, and then you start to look down the line and you want to cover college for grandkids or different things like that. You can do that if you create a plan. Yeah. Right. And that you've parsed these things out to understand, you know, this is supposed to be meant for my lifestyle through a reasonable longevity, even 100 years old. But then this surplus, here's how I'm going to allocate it and design it and so on and so forth. And that's why as an advisor, we look at tolerance. It matters. Right. Because we don't want to, you know, we make the joke sometimes we don't want to lead the witness. I don't mm-hmm. want to put you in a portfolio that you're uncomfortable with. But if you're a 30-something that this money's earmarked for retirement, like it's literally in a retirement account, and then you follow a survey that says you're a conservative investor, I don't think I do well by you by just following your risk survey. I think I have to have a conversation to say your time horizon is this. You get penalized if you actually take from this account. So you're going to be in this account for 30 years. Now, if that's defined, then how do you design a portfolio? And it goes further, right? We then start to look at what's the um, tax implications for this client versus this client, it's going to be different, Mm -hmm. right? What's the liquidity needs? So you then go through not only this first filter of time horizon and then tolerance, but it's so on and so forth to really tailor a portfolio to somebody, which that's why it's very difficult to self-direct a portfolio because there's a lot of variables, there's a lot of moving parts, and somebody like yourself that's had thousands of conversations on this um, has really been able to fine tune the craft um, and really hone in what, like, I would say solid advice looks like. Agreed. That was a compliment to you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Perfect. You're giving me the look, so it means you probably have an appointment coming up. <laughs> so we'll wrap up the podcast, but I, I really want you to remember those words because I was very thoughtful in how I named this. Got to respect time horizons. You must respect them. Um, I think uh, ultimately when people start to kind of poo-poo that stuff and say, hey, markets were ugly last year. Uh, It's only up from here. This is a $500 stock on sale for $200. That is usually the first chapter of a very troubling story. So for our listeners, please do respect time horizons. We'll ask that you rate the podcast five stars or preferred. All comments are welcome. An easy way to get a hold of Sean or Trevor would be to email us at tom, T-O-M, at thebonsagroup.com. We'd be happy to have a conversation, answer questions, or take your suggestions for future articles and podcast conversations. With that said, we will be back next week with more of our Thoughts Thoughts on on money. Money.